Hi, everyone, and thank you all for coming, or coming in this digital way to the workshop. It's really exciting to be able to be a part of the book fair, even from so far away. Uh, it's really cool, as usual, to know that it's happening and that people are getting together and organizing and discussing all this stuff as well. Um, my name is Barry Van, and I've been asked to give a workshop on, I was asked to give a workshop on critic and self-critic, tech mill as it's known here in Kurdistan and these practices that have been developed by the Kurdish freedom movement and then how we can learn from them, how we can use them, practice them ourselves and like what, um, what benefits they can bring and the reasons behind them and all this kind of thing. So I'm going to talk a little bit to begin with about the foundations of critic and self-critic like where it's come from, the history, the purpose of why we're doing it. So I wanted to share something with you that Sakina Jansis is quoted as saying. Sakina Jansis um, is a very prominent figure in the Kurdish freedom movement. She was one of the founding members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party. Um, and she devoted her life to the Kurdish liberation struggle and to the Kurdish women's movement. Um, and she, in the early 2000s, um, she's quoted as saying that the most important thing that the Kurdish freedom movement has done for like global revolution and the most significant achievement of this struggle is the work in developing personality, like the socialist personality, as she calls it. Um, and so what that means is like how people involved in the Kurdish freedom movement have been able to change themselves and to break their personalities from the influence of capitalism, from the influence of the state and so on. And so to start to like take steps towards creating freedom and to being able to like be uh, in our personalities, the future that, that they want to be, that they want to see. And so sometimes when I think about this stuff and this is all based on like developing our personalities and so on, it starts to sound a bit fluffy. And I like to remember that quote and who said it, you know, this is, um, a woman who's been through every kind of struggle you can possibly imagine in the prison, outside of the prison, in the mountains as a guerrilla fighter, like really knows her stuff about revolution in every form. And she considers that like working on ourselves, our personalities and the ways that we relate to each other to be like one of the most important things that we can do. So I find that really inspiring when thinking about like why critic and self-critic and these practices are important. So critic and self-critic is fundamentally a method for developing ourselves and developing our comrades. Um, but it's based on a set of values. It's within a context. We can't just take this one thing and kind of isolate it and just speak about that. I think you have to speak about the whole frame and about the set of like beliefs also that, um, that it's grown out of. You know, if we accept X, Y, and Z, then this as a process kind of makes sense. And so, you know, first of all, fundamentally, it's based on the premise that we all have toxic things from the system inside us, from the nation state, from capitalism, from growing and developing in these worlds. And this isn't just like a, a byproduct and a side effect. And if we materially destroyed the state tomorrow, even though that might be great, then all this stuff would go away. Like the state inside us and capitalism inside us are just as strong, just as important, if not more so than those outside. You know, the fact that we accept these as realities and agree to live this way is fundamental to the external state, capitalism, the system having control. So this, um, what's inside us and the ways that our personalities have been shaped by this stuff is a front line. And it's a really important one that we have to fight on and we have to have ways of defending ourselves also against like psychological warfare and against processes of assimilation and so on. Um, and when this first, this practice was first getting developed of like personality analysis as it's, it's done today all over the Kurdish freedom movement. Um, and it was developed a lot by Abdullah Ujlan, who's the imprisoned um, leader of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, who's also uh, written and developed a lot of ideology that things like the Rojava revolution are also based on. Um, and he's quoted as saying that when we look at a person, we look at their problems and we're making this analysis, it is never the moment, always the history, it is never the individual, it is always the society. 
So what that's saying is that one of the reasons we do this is because our problems, our faults, the ways that we perpetuate oppression, the ways that we harm each other, the ways that we create hierarchies, the toxic things that we have internalized, they're not just personal. They're not just your problem, just my problem. You have to deal with it by yourself. They're also symptoms of the way that the system works. And we need to understand them, we need to challenge them, and we need to like collectively find ways to deal with them. It's not to remove blame, to say, oh, it's society, it's nothing to do with me. It's very much about facing up to your faults, but accepting that you, are, um, you have been influenced by the system, so these are also part of that system. And it's also the whole idea of critic and self-critic is looking at love in a slightly different way. So instead of saying love means just accepting someone as they are, it's saying love means refusing to leave someone as they are when where they are might be really damaging to themselves and to other people and really um, difficult and they might be in a lot of pain or they might be causing other people pain. So if you really love someone, you'll help lift them out of that. And in that spirit, critique, criticizing the way someone behaves is always offered as a gift. It's, hey, you may not have realized this. I'm offering this to you as a gift because you didn't already know. And now we're giving you the power to change it. It also assumes a responsibility to each other. When we offer critique, we're making a commitment to each other. And we're saying that we trust that the other person is in this for the long term, that the other person wants to be able to change and the other person is part of a really important struggle. And we're also committing ourselves to also being part of that struggle, to receiving critique, to this back and forth. Um, it's practiced also as a system for dealing with conflict or ideally for avoiding conflict. Uh, staying, saying, you know, if we say that arguments, fights, this kind of conflict are not productive and are not going to get us anywhere, but that, you know, we don't live in a fantasy world where we think that problems are not going to come up in a group of people then this is also a concrete proposal for other ways of dealing with that stuff. It's also part of a wider structure of something that here people would call hevalti, which translates as friendship, but probably more accurately as like comradeship, um, without that kind of, some of the associations that the word comrade can have in English, I guess, literally it's friend, but it's used in this kind of political way. Um, and that as an approach to each other is you know, based on fundamentally on respect, on belief in the other person, and on a commitment that we are all in a long-term struggle together. We can see critic and self-critic as like a form of mutual aid, a way of giving and receiving help together to build better friendships and loves between us um, and to reimagine like how we relate to each other. And also here, it's seen as a really important aspect of building the militant personality. So building uh, revolutionaries. And here, you know, within the Kurdish freedom movement, it's very much understood that revolution comes from revolutionaries in some ways, it comes from a lot of different things, external, internal factors. But one of the things that we actually have the power and control to do for ourselves is develop ourselves as revolutionaries. And it sounds really big and grand and maybe a bit intense. And yeah, it can be. But also, it's just basically saying, you know, we need, we need to be ready for this fight. This is hard. Let's get ready. Let's get ready together. Let's get strong together. That's like the underlying basis of all of this. And so this is a method. And I will talk about the concrete ways that um, this is practiced, you know, like you do this, X, Y, and Z. But it's a lot more than that. It's also a mindset and a way of approaching each other. This idea of hevalti, this idea of comradeship, and this idea specifically with critic and self-critic of seeing critic in a different way, starting to see it as a gift, starting to appreciate it when you receive it, give it with love when you give it, and so on. And that's not easy. And so there is this structure that it's worth remembering has been built up over a long time, over years of experience. Um, and there is like a system and a set of more or less rules for how you deliver it. That's not to make something dogmatic or make us into robots or say that we can only communicate in this way. It's to help build a frame in which we can develop this mindset and really like deeply internalize 
seeing critique in these different ways and being able to approach each other in these different ways. So that's how I think it's helpful to understand these rules. It's not about like we have to do it this way. It's about like we want to think and feel in this way. And over years, you know, a revolutionary movement has through trial and error over and over again come up with a set of tools to help us think, feel and approach each other in this way. And so that revolutionary movement that we're referring to here is the Kurdistan liberation movement, the Kurdistan women's liberation movement often in particular I will refer to. Um, but this also, this idea of critic and self-critic platforms and so on has a history in a lot of different revolutionary movements. Uh, Maoist movements have also used it and so on and uh, traditional like Marxist Leninist uh, organizations were using this a lot 50, 60 years ago, it's not uncommon. Um, but since what they call the change of paradigm, so since the Kurdish freedom movement came up with this very different ideology, took a step, you know, another step again away from, kind of on top of, away from like transforming this Marxist Leninist perspective um, into this like radical uh, feminist and ecologist perspective, um, the critic and self critic has kind of been brought with that. So it now has to be approached with, with that in mind, not like a strict uh, traditional Marxist Leninist perspective. And also with the understanding that the methods and so on have changed a bit with, from, with influence from that paradigm as well. Um, it also draws on history that goes way back a lot longer. For example, here in the Middle East, there's old um, Yazidi community practices of like community accountability and justice that look a lot like a, a platform of critic and self-critic. Um, when people present, you know, what they see to have been the faults of a person and then they're expected to like give their own uh, account of themselves without making excuses and so on. Um, so there are these older, more traditional things that already look a lot like this. There's also from a lot of different communities in Africa, these different ideas of um, justice um, in indigenous communities like across the world in different places. Um, and so they have all, you know, these roots go way back. It's not something that just like was come up with by magic in the 60s, um, but it's been adapted to a context and it's been made part of a revolutionary struggle. Critic and self-critic is used in a lot of different contexts. It's used day to day, um, just very simply like as a way of communicating with each other. Um, it's used in the context of a platform, which is possibly the biggest and most formal setup, and that's when one person is kind of under the focus of the critic of um, their comrades, their rivals, the wider community, like whoever it is. And that can be because some problem has emerged, because that person has like done something bad, in short. Um, and people want to say like exactly how and why it was bad, why they think it's part of um, oppressive behavior, why they think it's perpetuating um, perpetuating different kinds of oppressions. Um, that person also then has a chance to reflect on those critics, but it doesn't become about like a, a to and fro thing or about punishment um, necessarily. Um, and or that, but a platform also can be just about personality analysis. So like each person in the group takes their turn and this happens in the uh, Kurdish movement often at the end of a period of like education. So people uh, come together into a space to learn together, see seminars, um, discuss and basically like learn ideology more or less, but also spend time together, live a really communal life. And at the end of that period, quite often there will be platforms for everyone. So people will offer their reflections on that person's personality and how they can develop it. I've done this a couple of times and like it's really intense and weird. And it's also really, really amazing. And when you have that relationship of comradeship and respect, with your friends, with the people that you're with, with the people that you've worked to build that with, not just people who you coincidentally happen to like. And then people give reflections. It's, it's really absolutely amazing. It can be really, really hard, um, but it's also really, really amazing uh, when you start to see like how it works. So more specifically how it works. I've gone on for a while about context and background. Um, Critic is literally what it says on the tin. It is you criticizing the other person in as constructive a manner as possible. And it should always be not only constructive, but within like a frame, not just a kind of random thing thrown out there, but a way that you can explain, you know, how this was linked to like a shared value that you have that is good, that you feel that this um, behavior or this action or whatever went against. 
It can be done at absolutely any time as well, but there are these structured spaces for it, tech mail, uh, platform, and so on. Um, and there's reasons for that. So if you do it outside of those spaces, it's good to say very clearly, you know, I want to I wanna criticize you. Is this a good time? Do you have headspace? Shall we sit together, you know, rather than just jumping on a person? Um, and also there is a reason that it's done in a shared space. Sometimes you do it one-on-one, -on -one, and that can be because you know that it's going to be easier for that person. It's not so like dogmatic that you have to always do it in front of everyone. But one of the founding principles of the practice of critic and self-critic is that we all can learn from each other's critics. You know, when someone gets up and criticizes me, there's going to be a few people also sitting around going, oh, yeah, no, I definitely do that too. Or, wow, I could do that really easily, so I will think about why not, or I've never even thought about this this way before. So it really helps to share it with the group more widely. And it also helps because then one person was maybe thinking the same thing, and then they know that someone else has said it, so they don't also have to come to you and say it. We'll get to that in a minute. Anyone can offer critique to anyone, regardless of what your position is in the organization, regardless of your role, regardless of some sense of hierarchy. Again, obviously this is in theory, this can be really difficult, but another thing about these practices and this structure is that the idea is that it makes it easier to do that because it gets past this like informal sense of not being able to cross that line and make that critic because there's a structure set up for the space that invites that to happen. So it's like making a step to make that easier. And so generally, you would all be together in a group um, and this, uh, the rule or convention is that you always, always deliver critic in the third person. And it's kind of weird the first few times. So all right, we're sitting in a circle um, and I, you know, would say to my Haval, whose name is um, Elena, um, but I would not say to her, I would say like, um, I need to offer critic to Heval Elena because I have seen this, this and this that she does. I think it's really bad in this way and I think it would be better if the friend tried to do this. This is also done, I'm not like staring directly at Elena because this is, you know, really intimidating, um, really difficult and just like not looking directly at the person you don't dramatically stare away either. Uh, but you deliver it like to the room, to the group, you're talking communally. Partly because as we said, all critics apply to everyone, um, but partly because it really does make it easier to hear. It's a little bit weird and stiff at first and you kind of have to get used to it when you're not used to it, but then it becomes a much less like intense thing than someone saying you, looking at you, um, and all that pressure being on you in, in that moment, really like it's much easier to feel and it's also much easier to deliver something in a good way when you're speaking in that way because it kind of pulls the rug out from under any temptation that you might have to accidentally move into aggression to speak in an angry way because this is also very much not how critique should ever be delivered. Always in a calm and a clear way, in a good manner, as constructive as possible, trying to get to the point and have suggestions for how the person could do better. Not avoiding the issue or tiptoeing around anything, we should go as deep as possible, but in a constructive way. And the harder something is going to be for someone to hear, the more important all this stuff is. Like if you know something is really, really difficult for that person to hear, it's good to try and overcome this thing to think, maybe I won't say this in technical, it'll be too much, I'll just go to them personally, because then we can get really stuck in um, kind of emotional tangles or in like delivering things in a bad way or back in roles that we have normally in that friendship, that, that kind of space of tech mill. Um, gives us a chance to step outside of um, and it also gives the person a chance to like absorb it before they respond because this is one of the most important fundamental parts of critic is that you don't respond to it you just listen take it in and you learn what you can I'll go more into all the kind of ifs and buts of that in a moment but like it gives space first and foremost for our emotions to settle before we like come to this topic again so it's not that someone's saying something to us and we're immediately coming back with how that makes us feel and that's one of the reasons one of the reasons why we don't respond to critic we just take it in we just hear it uh, you don't repeat critics as i've said as i've repeated <laughs> um if i have criticized heval elena and my friend uh, heval uh, georgina was gonna do the same thing she says okay better said it no need for me to say it. it's out there 
It's not about everyone attacking that person laying in and saying, yeah, and another thing, and I also think you do this, and da 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 da, da. Once it's out there, it's out there, and the person has heard that, which is what's important, and now we all um, have to show that we believe in that person's desire and ability to change themselves. And so part of that is not just kind of re-emphasizing things. Crucially, critique is the end of it. Once something is out there, you do not hold a grudge and socially exclude that person and sulk at them and remain angry with them. You do not go and talk behind someone's back about them. Of course, again, we're all human. This stuff is difficult. And quite often, you will talk about someone else before you make critic because you need advice from another friend. You go and say, oh, I need to criticize this person for this, but actually I'm really worried about how to do it. Am I like, how can I do it in a good way? What do you think? Do you think it's a good time? Like, these things happen. So yes, of course, but that's part of the process of getting to critique. What we don't do is go and moan about that person, rant about that person, back chat them. And especially once the critique is out there because you're now offering it to them and you're giving them a chance to change. It might take time. And the deeper and harder the critique is and the bigger a deal it is, probably the more time it's going to take and the more space we need to allow. So again, just as lots of people don't all say the same thing in the same session, you don't jump on the person again the next day for exactly the same thing. If enough time passes and you start to say, I think they really weren't listening to that critic, that's when it comes back up again. And also, you know, the added critic of, and you've heard this before and we feel you didn't respond. But you need to give time and space for these things. And during that time, like, it's, it's been said clearly to that person, it's been shared with them, and so you don't go and chat behind their back. And we should all know, we should have trust and faith that that's not how we're treating each other because it's out in the open. So even though it can be kind of weird and scary, when you compare it to maybe a situation where you know people are talking about you, it's actually a lot less weird and scary and horrible than that. Collective critique is also really common. It's also really common to say, I critique the whole group, including myself, maybe not including myself for something that happened, or like maybe including myself for something we are doing as a group and as a collective. So again, then it's about everybody hearing it, reflecting on how they are a part of that. And so self-critic is kind of the other side of this, which is you expressing your critique of your own behavior, actions, tendencies, attitudes, whatever it is. And basically, it's the same thing and done in the same way. So that means that you share things to the same depth, with the same clarity, with the same analysis, and from the same set of values as you would about someone else, with the same honesty, same integrity, and so on. It also means you share it with the same love. Self-critique isn't like flagellation time or crisis time. It's also not sympathy time. It's definitely, you know, you need to be in a place where you can say clearly, I give my critic for this. And if you're still in a place where you're actually kind of not criticizing yourself and you feel more hurt or injured or like you need to justify yourself, then you're not giving self-critic yet. Maybe you don't need to. Maybe you need to think a bit harder and work on it before you bring it to tech mill. And so yeah. to come back to, well, self-critic isn't about justifying or getting sympathy, uh, to come back to this point about not responding to critics. Why is this? And it can be really difficult. When you receive a critic, you're supposed to accept it and reflect on it. If you really didn't understand, you can clarify later, but try and check that temptation. You know, quite often we're saying, just to, to understand exactly why you think I did that, when I don't think I did, it's not really because you didn't understand, it's because you're you know, feeling defensive, and we all do. It's completely normal. That's why this whole practice and process and structure has been built up. Yes. We all have defensive feelings. We all have immediate reactions. We all have immediate emotions. That's fine. This practice doesn't say that we can't have them. In fact, it totally full on accepts that we do and allows them, but tries to make a space that they don't cause a problem. Because so often in these interactions, normally it's not actually what's being said it's like the way we deal with it it's not the problem it's our attempt at the solution that can get us into into bigger problems than we were in in the first place and ultimately into conflict and so this you know this structure accepts that and says you don't react you go away and think and reflect it can also be that for ages you just don't get it you actually don't agree with that critic and that's okay it can be that after a really long time months a year suddenly something clicks and you go oh now I get what they were what they were talking about it makes sense um, but ultimately you also don't have to agree 
A critic is not set in stone. Critique, someone not arguing with critique doesn't mean that it's like right. And one thing that's really important to understand about this whole, this whole practice is this isn't about black and white thinking. This isn't about like the truth and false. And this isn't about like us seeing something really, really clearly and that being the only way to see it. This is about us offering our perspective, which is all we have as human beings to other human beings, our comrades, to add to their perspective and try and develop them. You don't defend yourself against a, tr a critic. You don't jump up and defend someone else against a critic. You don't go and find your friend afterwards and say, hey, that critic that Berevan gave you, nah, definitely not fair. Don't agree, she was wrong, okay? Because just because it's said in Tech Mill doesn't mean there's an assumption that it is somehow objectively correct or even that everyone agrees. But it does mean that there's something in it that you need to listen to. Even if it's just how you came across to that one person on that one day, and maybe it's really out of character and strange, but then why did it happen? And maybe it is just a complete fluke. That person completely got you wrong or they had their information wrong. Again, that's kind of okay because that means that it just won't ever come up again. It was just a one-off. Um, and maybe other people thought it was kind of weird as well, and everyone will have forgotten about it in a very short amount of time. If it does keep coming up again and again, then you're probably wrong that it's unfair. It's probably accurate in some way that maybe we don't want to don't look at ourselves and don't want to think about yet. Um, and again, people will have different perspectives. We'll have different perspectives on our comrades and on what they do, but everyone's perspective has something of value in it. And when you see what you say to other people as offering this and what they say to you as like offering this, um, then it becomes much more clear that, that this is what we're doing. It's not about uh, condemning someone. It's not about judging someone. It's also a lot of people that practice uh, this kind of critic and self-critic in the Kurdish freedom movement would say it's not about apologizing. And I think, in my opinion, this isn't something we have to be dogmatic about. If you want to go and find someone and apologize for something that you did between people, this could be a perfectly nice thing to do. And maybe in different cultures, also it carries different weight. Um, but the point of critic, of receiving critic well, is not doing it again. And apologizing doesn't really affect that. You can apologize and still do it again. You can not apologize and not do it again. You can apologize and not do it again. That's also great. But the important focus is thinking about, okay, how, why do I do this? What's like underlying this? And how can I not do it again? And when we're giving critique, we also need to look at ourselves like really carefully. You know, why am I giving this critic? Is it really uh, what I want to do? Is it a gift that I'm offering to this person? Do I really believe that this person can change? And do I really want to say this to help them change in a direction that I think is better, not just for them, but really better for like our values and what we believe in? Or is it that I'm currently motivated by anger, that I want to shame that person, punish that person, condemn them? Um, am I criticizing the whole person instead of an incident, an approach, an attitude, or something like this? Because really we should never say like, this person is. It should always be like, this person did, or this person behaved, or so on. Because when we get stuck in this person is, we've lost the whole principle that people can change. And not only is critic and self-critic founded on the principle that people can change, revolution has to be founded on the principle that people can change, right? Because if not, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, so as revolutionaries and as people who believe in social change, we have to believe in personality change. If we don't believe in that, we need to think about why. We need to you know, look at how like nihilism has crept in or like what we really believe and what we're struggling for here. If we're still angry and we can't give critique in a calm way and we can't like follow the process, then we don't give it. Maybe we need some other kind of conflict resolution. Maybe we need to go to someone else for advice. Maybe we need to figure out why we can't make a constructive critic out of this and it's just this kind of rage. Again, it's not denying that people have feelings or saying that you're wrong for having them. It's trying to create a space where we can use them differently and in, in a more productive way. And so all of this stuff, it's always tied to something wider. I think it can be really, really hard to get used to practicing this. And I'm not for a second proposing that we just like go, okay, 
I've been writing down all these points and now I'm going to pick them up and we're just going to follow this set of instructions in our group and then it's going to be great. Because it would be pretty hard, right? Or it often is. I mean, it's hard for people here also. Um, I think what's really helpful about this is if we can start to see this as a positive, start to see this as a good way of communicating, trying to build the communities that can support this, you know, then asking like, why is it difficult? What are we struggling with? And paying attention to that, to that part of how we relate to each other, to that part of our communities and trying to develop the communities where this mindset and this way of uh, being with each other can flourish because that's also a really, really important work. And this isn't perfected by anyone. Like I've been here in the Rojava revolution now for over a year and loads of people who should know better and are an example because they've been doing this for so much longer have like dealt with critic and self-critic and tech mill in not an ideal way. It's happened. Everyone's human. So when we try and do it and it doesn't maybe work out ideally, that doesn't mean that it's not going to work and that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. And quite often the point is that it's better than the alternative. And the point is also that whilst you know, I've seen and worked with people uh, dealing with this in a not ideal way. I've also seen it really, really work in a really, truly amazing way. And I've seen people take leaps and bounds in their personalities. And I have learned stuff about myself. And I have appreciated and loved the perspective that my friends and comrades have been able to give me. And that's, you know, as well as and despite as the fact that it just doesn't always work ideally and as it should on paper. I think it can be particularly difficult in, uh, in my experience of um, different of our groups and communities in Europe and in other parts of like uh, the West, whatever, whatever you want to call it, places where neoliberalism is really strong and where like liberalism and individualism are really strong. And why is that? I think we have this uh, different perception of what love means. Uh, that it just means completely accepting someone the way they are and affirming them constantly. The affirmation is, is love. Um, and that if anyone challenges or criticizes you, that means that they're judging you and it means that they don't like you. So it's kind of the opposite of what people here say critique is. They say critique is love. Um, and that when you like and care about someone, the most caring thing you can do is offer them critique. And it's very, very hard for us to wrap our heads around that. It's hard for everyone to wrap our heads around that. And I think it can be particularly hard in uh, communities where we have this more liberal and individualized mode of life. This also needs a commitment to communal life. You only hang out with someone once a week. It's a difficult thing to practice when or when you know that someone might just disappear any day, might just leave town, leave the group and there's not this like long term commitment to each other. Then it's much harder to practice these things because these are you know tied to watching our friends develop over a long time to being able to show lots of love to our friends in the time after we give them really hard critique um, and to people being committed to saying yeah okay i will be with you in my full personality so you can see me warts and all rather than having these kind of bubbled individual lives that are separated off and where we keep ourselves kind of locked away from our friends and comrades it can be too easy to just leave situations when things get hard in europe um, it really can, like our response is to flit and go instead of stay and work through things. And this also, we have to remember that this is linked to radical revolutionary struggle and we have to keep it that way. You know, I could imagine some twisted, weird, warped version of critic and self-critic being used to like make businessmen better businessmen or something. Um, and that's where it comes back to the values. It's not just like a random thing in your perception. It has to come from a set of shared values that you give this critique. You know, what's the ideal? What are our values? And then what are we critiquing that wasn't in line with that? Um, and we have to look at what those shared values are. And we have to, in some way, agree on them. And again, if we look and we discover that we're not sure what our shared values are, maybe this is something else that we need to develop. And so things in the Kurdish liberation movement, like anti-capitalism and gender liberation, they're not like interchangeable for other things. They are a part of tech mill. They are a part of critic and self-critic in this system. And on that note, another very important kind of structural thing that we have with critic and self-critic is that you would practice it autonomously um, in the women's movement. And so maybe in Europe, we have like uh, different kind of lines drawn around like 
you know, how we're defining gender or like who's part of that autonomous space, this space that isn't for cis men. Um, but I think the really important fact here, the important key thing here is that those spaces exist and that we remember why they exist to fight patriarchy and also challenge capitalism and the state and everything, uh, all these other oppressions that are fundamentally based on, on patriarchy and linked to patriarchy. Um, and so you practice your critic and self-critic autonomously within that group and then in front of the men, you don't criticize each other. You criticize the men and they can criticize you, of course. Um, but you don't criticize each other in front of the men because you have to present a united front because one of the greatest things that patriarchy has managed to do is to divide people who are most oppressed by patriarchy and turn us against each other instead of us standing together and standing up to patriarchy. And so it's a really important part of critic and self-critic that we use it to bring ourselves more together. And no matter how hard and difficult and stressful things are when you're in that autonomous space, uh, when you're in a shared space, you are a united front. And it doesn't mean pretending you don't think your friends have faults. It just means that that's how the practice is. There's no need for men to hear that stuff and to um, perceive it as like a division. And of course, they're welcome and more than invited to deliver the strongest critic that they can and that we will deliver, always deliver it back to them. And so we can adapt this stuff. And in my experience, often people are not that dogmatic. They deliver in a slightly different way. It does get adapted. Um, but it's also worth remembering that these techniques have been built up through trial and error over a long time by people really committed to this. So I think it's really worth giving them a go as they are, as they kind of concretely are, and thinking about why we want to adapt. Are we adapting because we live in a different context? We have a different uh, kind of frame around us and so it doesn't make sense? Or are we adapting because it's difficult and we don't really want to do it and we're not willing to give it a try? So we can and should adapt when needed, but I think it's also really worth like giving this stuff a try as it is. And it will take time and it will take patience for people to become used to, um, to these practices and to these techniques. And you know, one person being like, I've cracked it, I've figured out critic and self-critic, you're all getting it wrong, not the point. Like forcing something that people aren't ready for or that people haven't got the idea of yet and don't agree with yet is really not the point. You know, we need to move slowly, steadily and caringly um, through these steps but in my opinion we can learn so much from this and we can take so much from it in the whole frame that surrounds it and the basis of like how we can come to love and care about each other and how we can develop ourselves to be strong for the fight you know we love and care about each other and we're also like here to do the work to make a revolution and so this is um, a really important tool for how we can take steps closer to doing that and we should do that as lovingly and caringly as possible and at the speed that everyone needs to move but um, I think this can be a really important tool for how we can do that. So I'm hoping that the technique will work out that I can see you all for questions and answers. I hope this was useful anyway and maybe we'll have a backup person for questions and answers if not and also there should be some links somewhere attached to this video. I don't know where. Um, but I sent to the wonderful book fair people. Um, and that is to a genealogy website with a brochure that was made from the uh, an education. I mentioned earlier there's these kind of periods of closed education that happen a lot within the Kurdish freedom movement. And we made one in the Internationalist Genealogy Academy last year. We produced a brochure from that with the different topics that we talked about. And it also covers like critic, self-critic and platforms a little bit more. Um, in depth and like discussing them. So you can download it there in the link on the genealogy website, which is also worth checking out in general. Um, there's a link to Plan C, which made a module about the Rojava revolution and the Kurdish freedom movement, things we can learn from it. And there's a lot of like audios, videos and writings on there if you wanna learn a bit more about Rojava in general. Obviously we haven't had time and space today for me to talk about that at all. The same goes for the Kurdish Solidarity Network link. Um, and Women Defend Rojava also is a, a campaign website um, that will explain like the revolution in Rojava, what's been going on historically and also the current situation and how you can like get involved and support um, if people are looking for a bit more of that like broader frame. But thank you so much for listening and I hope that we get a chance to talk soon.